Functions in C++ by Ali Karabudi. In this presentation, we will review the functions in C++. Functions give us the availability of being able to organize our code into segments. Segments with their own specific functionalities that all together can produce a program. A function usually looks like this type, name, and then bunch of parameters, which are the input value or variables to the function, and then bunch of statements, which are going to be everything that you want to do with those parameters, and then return the name. So the type defines the type of the value that will be returned by the function. It could be integer, character, float, anything, or any type of the uh, types that we already are aware of and we have learned before. Then there is a name, which basically is the identifier by which the function can be called. So you can say integer final value, and then final value is what you can use as a placeholder of the final result of the functionalities of the function. Then you define the input parameters which basically each parameter consists of a type followed by an identifier with each parameter being separated from the next by comma. For example, you can say uh, parameter, instead of parameter 1, you can say integer x. Instead of parameter 2, you can say integer y. So then finally, the statements define a block of statements that specify what the function actually does. So it's pretty simple. You have the return value defined by name and the input values defined by the parameters of different types and then all the processes that happens over whatever is being in entered into the function. For example, in this specific small code, you can see we have integer, which is the type of the function. Then you have the name here called addition. And then you have the parameters here, integer A and integer B. Notice that you define the data type and then the data variable name. And then the statements are showing over here. So we pass A and B to this function. We do some process on A and B. And then we have a return value which actually will be assigned to addition. As you remember, each program has an integer main function to begin with. It doesn't matter where integer main function is placed within the program body. It will be the uh, input of the program no matter what. So the compiler always starts with running integer main. And then at any point, if you call another function, which the calling, as you can see in this line, can happen through just using the name of the function, then the control goes to that function, enters the function, processes the function, and when the return value is being passed back to the function name, the control goes back to where it left off before and continues the execution. For example, over here, the first thing that happens is when you call addition function with passing parameters to it, 5 will be passed to the parameter A. Look here. And then 3 will be passed to parameter B. So basically, it's going to be addition of 5 and 3. So then 5 sits in the place of A. And then 3 sits in the place of B in this formula. So the integer R, which is locally defined for this specific function, will be the sum of A and B, which in this case you expect it to be 8. So after that 8 is being calculated, that value will be passed to Z through the addition function. So basically, this expression over here, z equals addition of 5 and 3 
will get equal to 8 because of how this function is defined. So again, we have a type that defines the type of the return value of the function. We have a function name that basically is an identifier by which the function can be called. As you can see, this is how we call the function. And then we have the input values or parameters, which you have to define the type for each one. In our case, both are integer, but you can have an integer, a float, a character, a bool, or whatever you can use. So after calling the function, function will be executed, and the final value of the function, which will be the return value actually, is going to return to whatever you use in order to store the return value of the function. It's as easy as that. Okay, now let's do a practice uh, and develop some code for um, showing some usage of the functions. Uh, of course, we're going to need an integer main like any other program. As we said, main is a standard function for any program no matter what. And uh, let's say for the sake of this example, we want to develop a code that actually, let me just put a note over here. Uh, calculation of sales price based on tax rate and a special factor. It could be like a discount. How about that? To make it a little bit more complicated so that um, you guys learn through it. So the first thing is I need to um, get the information from the user. Okay. And to get the information from the user, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send user a message and ask user to enter the tax rate, enter the local tax rate, okay? And of course, that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to get in uh, the tax rate, tax rate. And of course, uh, we need to define tax rate. It usually is uh, a float. So I define a tax rate float. So we're all good. And then I'm going to see out, please enter the items price which is going to be what they enter as the price and I'm going to store this in item price and of course that should be defined to begin with there we go so that's my item price and then I'm going to ask user to tell me if there is a discount code. Please enter the discount amount. So basically we keep it like user or the cashier is going to enter uh, the dollar amount of the discount. So we're going to enter discount over here and I'm going to define that as another float as we use it. Uh, guys, one thing to notice is uh, my style is uh, to usually just uh, define the variables after I actually use them. Uh, so that, that, is, that is how I code. Uh, some of you guys may think about all the variables, uh, variables to begin with, or define them all and then use them um, as it come. Um, don't, it doesn't matter if, if you do it in my way or any other way. Just as, as far as at the end of the day you have all the uh, variables defined and they're used, you're all good. So in order to make sure, like a test point, that our code is functional and doing everything correctly, I'm going to print them all. So I understand the item value is and 
and uh, I'm going to put it like this. The item value is, of course, that is going to be the uh, price or item price, sorry. So that's the item price. And of course, and it is taxed by, and of course, we're going to put the tax rate over here. Tax rate, there you go. Okay, and then um, the discount going and everything, just, just a checkpoint. So let's run this and see what we get. Uh, so basically it is compiled. So please enter the tax rate. I'm going to put 0 0.9. Please enter the item price. That's $100. And the discount is 0. So let me just move this up a little bit so you can see it. Basically, this is what I have. So I understand the item price is 100. And let me just make the formatting get a little bit nicer than what you can think okay let's run it again and see if that looks how we like it now so it's asking for uh, the local tax rate I'm gonna put in 90 percent and then oh actually it's a lot of tax but anyway uh, so we're gonna put 100 over here and the discount amount is zero so very good so as of now, we have a simple program that actually is formatted well and works pretty much as we want it to work. Uh, and then that's going to be like, let's say, 009 this time. And it's going to be 100. And it's going to be 0. OK. So uh, now is a time to create the tax function and uh, then call it within the program. Let's create that function because the return value, the final value is gonna be float, so I'm using the float type, and then I simply call it tax, all capital. And the values that we pass to it are gonna be uh, A, which we consider A to be our uh, price, and it's gonna be B, which is going to be our tax rate and it's going to be C which is going to be our uh, discount. So ABC is going to be passed to our friend over here. So now we want to do the calculations for uh, the price item price calculation. So what I do over here is now that I have the price, the tax rate and the discount, the formula will be very simple. So I define integer, sorry, it should be float, final price of item, and then final price of item will be equal to, of course, the original price, which is A, plus what I have is going to be tax times the price, so it's going to be basically A times, sorry, uh, A times B, yes, exactly. Uh, there you go. And the whole thing is going to get deducted by the discount, which is in this case C. And there you go. And the calculation is complete. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to return this uh, final price of item and I'm pretty good over there so let's see what happens so we pass a B and C to this tax function and the tax function basically um, gets those values and does this calculation and returns whatever is the result of this calculation if you notice this final price of item is just the local variable and uh, does not matter for any other function so it is only usable within the scope of this function which is within the function so now that we have all this what we need to do is and let me just 
make this look nice. So what we need to do is just call the final price of the item. So we want to show, let's say, is x. I define a float x, which is going to be what I'm going to print out at the end. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to call the tax function and just look at how I'm going to be passing the parameters to it. It should be within the same order. So as you can see up here, float A supposed to be the item price. So I'm going to put down the item price over here. Float B supposed to be the tax rate, which we got it here. So then I'm going to send it the tax rate. And float C is going to be the discount. So discount. And there you go. So this calculation of the tax is going to happen over there. So after the calculation happened, it's going to pass it to the tax. And then here, tax is going to get assigned to X. Okay. So the next thing I need to do is simply go ahead and see out final purchase price will be and of course I will send X to take care of that and a nice end line just to make it look nice nice and neat let's compile and see what's gonna happen so the program is asking me to enter the tax rate so let's say my tax rate is nine percent so that it is the item that I'm buying is hundred dollars in value and then they're giving me ten dollars of discount and it's telling me that the final price that I need to pay is gonna be ninety nine dollars so basically he knows that it's hundred dollar taxed by nine percent which is gonna make it one oh nine dollar and then ten dollars is gonna be the discount so I'm gonna get ninety nine out of it so let's run this again and this time we want to try to see if we give the tax zero and we give the item price hundred and no discount now of course the payable is going to be hundred i always recommend you to run the program for some different values some different crazy values that you think may cause a problem let's say if they are taxing us fifty percent for a hundred dollar item you can guess it's going to be 150 and if they give us twenty dollar discount it's going to be 130 that we need to pay at the end and the program is calculating it. so pretty simple pretty straightforward again we have our main function over here which basically just takes care of input output and calling the other functions and then we have our tax function up up here which is going to do uh, calculate the final price of the item uh, the naming is not that important how you name it, but of course, like always, I recommend you to name it in a way that you can always remember what it is meant to do and what it is there to do. Uh, good news is you can have as many functions as you want defined within uh, the body of the program. To make this program a little bit more amazing, let's do define another function float uh, special which uh, receives the final price let's say it receives the float a and remember I can reuse a b c and so on as many times as I want because these are local variables and they are only working in the scope of the function that they are not over the global scope of the program so I'm gonna give uh, float a which is the final price of the item and uh, let's say the deal is if the price of the item was above two hundred dollars then we want to add another twenty dollar discount to the customer so basically what we need to do is want to do an if then else right so if and let's do define another float and I'll call it final uh, price so let's check if the price is greater than 200 
So if the price is greater than 200, sorry, my fingers. So what we want to do is we want to subtract 20 bucks from the final price. So final price will be A minus 200. Correct? And if this is not the case, if um, that's not the case, else the final price will equal to A. So we don't do anything. That's the final price and all that. So and finally we want to return the final price. And there you go. Pretty simple, right? So let's review again to see what we did. So uh, this function that we just created basically receives the item price and checks if it is greater than 200 and in that case oh good to catch that actually gives a discount of $20 and if it is not the case then doesn't do anything and returns the price so basically if you pass the final price of the item to this function it basically checks it for you and returns it back so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back here and now I'll call X equals because now X is done with the tax and everything right and this time I'm let me just pull this down a little bit so I'm gonna call the final price uh, the special item of the final price so basically SPEC and then this time I'm gonna pass X to it so what happens is first time that I call tax for X I'm actually assigning whatever is the final price to X and then second time I send X to the spec to get checked against that requirement and then come back to me okay let's pull this up and uh, compile the program so to test it um, I'm gonna enter values like 9% over there and then this time I'm gonna put $400 to uh, see what it's gonna be no discount as you can see it's 416 which actually the discount is applied but in order to see if the discount gets applied or not I'm gonna copy this line and uh, put it over here just to uh, be a check for how our program is working and then I'll change this final purchase price will be this final pur purchase price with special offer will be this okay so let's do it again please enter the tax rate of course that is nine percent the item price is hundred dollars and the discount is zero so as you can see I have 109 without a special and then I have 109 with the special because the price is not above uh, 200 because 109 is less than that so let's run it again and this time I'm trying to get the discount so this time I'm gonna enter same or 8 percent tax but $600 value and zero discount so as you can see this time it's going to be 648 after taxes are calculated and after the special is being applied now I have 628 which is $20 less so as you can see if you have these functions different functions within your program already set up uh, in the main you simply can call them and this just one uh, line of the code is going to take care of all the calculations within there. The good thing with this type of coding is you can always go back and change a small piece of code uh, to apply a huge change without no need for changing everything and double checking everything. So it's kind of like encapsulated. So you have small functions that they have their own variables within themselves and take care of a specific part of the job without actually being all over the place. 
For example, if all of a sudden the owner decides, okay, if somebody is making a purchase greater than 200, now I'm going to give them $100 of discount. You simply just change this and everything in your program is going to be right where it is. Let's give it a try and see if that $100 now is working. So, uh, the tax rate is 8% and I have $700 of the price. Let's say $5 discount that I gave already at the cashier. So it's going to be $751, the final purchase price. But with the special offer, it's going to be $651, which is $100 less. Uh, that's uh, easy. As you can see, now we have uh, almost like 40 lines of code, including the 10 lines over there. So third line of code that actually is taking care of a pretty decent calculation. Uh, in, a, in a real life scenario, you really don't need to have uh, both of these lines in there, as you remember. I just put this line in to um, be able to show you how it happens. But basically, what you want to do is just get rid of this. And uh, this is all the calculation you need. So if you run this final <clears throat> code, uh, let's say you arrive at the cashier now, all the information that you need to provide is this 9% enter the item price let's say four hundred and fifty dollars uh, the local discount let's say two dollars and now they know how much they have to pay to get out with the offer or without the offer so now you don't even care if this is above 200 or below 200 because everything automatically happens proper use of functions can make your program very effective and uh, the only thing that you have to have in mind every time you use multiple functions within your program is to make sure you don't actually create any logical error or um, any loop that the program is not getting out of it. So let me just clean this up so we can actually look at a smaller program. I'll in just want a screen hopefully that those of you who want to type it can actually take advantage of this uh, here you go that's the entire program that we have okay there we go so all the functions that I used over here in this example at this point basically have a return type um, in some cases this return type may become void or basically nothing. Let me just clean this up to show you what I mean by what I just said. Basically, there we go. So we have our integer main, let's say, here you go. That's the standard body of the program and then Let's say I want to create a function that basically just prints a line of code. So in this case, there is no return value to that specific line that gets printed. So I name it void print error. And there is no value that I want to pass over there. The only thing that this one does is it does a C out. Sorry, not a quite C out that says this is our error message. There we go. And that's all what it does. And now in the main, I will just call the function that we have, which is the print error. And that's that's all I do. Let's run this guy. As you can see, it simply prints out the, this is an error message of the program. So this is a simple way of dealing with a void function. Sometimes uh, you can just put void in here. It is not necessary, uh, but I mean, it, it, it shows that you understand that no argument is being passed to that function. And if you run this, as you can see, the result is the same. So as you know, uh, smart people are lazy, so I just simply leave it like that. 
and as you can see the result is the same. Okay, now is the time to talk about the return value of main. You all have seen this return zero in the past, and you all have seen the return type is defined as integer. So there is a catch. If the execution of the main ends normally without encountering any error, a return statement is going to be executed and compiler assumes the function ends with an implicit return statement which is return zero and basically when you run it it gives you back a return code of zero note that this only applies to function main for historical reasons all other functions with a return type shall end with a proper return statement that includes a return value even if this never used when main returns zero either implicitly or explicitly it is interpreted by the environment as that the program ended successfully so that's like historical assignment other values may be returned by main let's let's give it a try like I can change this to 5 and compile it and as you can see, that's going to tell me that the program ended with the exit code of 5. So other values may be there. It's not just uh, limited to 1. And actually, some environments give access to that value to the caller in some way. So uh, some other caller, some other uh, function caller can call for this value. Although this behavior is not required, nor necessarily uh, portable between platforms. So the value for main that are guaranteed to be interpreted in the same way for all the platforms are you can have uh, value 0, uh, which basically uh, means the program ended successfully. You can have a value called exit. Let me just put it over here so you can see. So you can say a return exit uh, underscore success which as you can see is defined within the compiler which means the program was successful same as return zero that's exactly the same thing uh, this value is defined in the header uh, stdio or ios stream depending on what uh, compiler you're working with and then you have the exit with failure which means the program failed and this value is also defined in the same header. So you can uh, simply choose that to happen instead of having ex uh, return zero. So uh, as you can see now, the exit code is again zero while we are asking for exit success. Pretty simple. So because the implicit uh, return zero statement for main is basically um, always there even though it's a tricky exception some authors consider it good practice to explicitly write this statement exit success instead of return zero but as far as you understand zero means exit with success you can simply hold on to it as exit zero so even if you um, keep it like exit success as you just noticed it's gonna return zero back to you with the integer value so pretty simple also remember that main must always return an integer even even though I'm returning a string over here which basically is a parameter not a string uh, still I'm returning an integer so the value assigned to exit success within the compiler is considered zero let's see what happens if I change this integer to let's say string And if I compile it, you see that the build failed because main must return an integer. So remember that. And as, as far as you just remember, main is always integer. It doesn't matter how the exit value is. So far, uh, whatever we have done actually has been the arguments which uh, have been passed by their value. This means that when calling a function, what is passed to the function are the values of these arguments on the moment of the call. 
which are copied into the variables represented by the function parameters. For example, look at uh, integer x equals 5, y equals 3, and uh, z. When we call a function, namely addition, and uh, we pass x and y, in this case, function addition is passed 5 and 3, which are copies of the values of x and y, respectively for sure. These values, 5 and 3, are used to initialize the variable set as parameters in the function's definition. But any modification of these variable within the function has no effect whatsoever on the values of the variable x and y outside it because x and y were themselves not passed to the function on the call but only copies of their values at the moment. So basically as you can see here 5 and 3 are going there and whatever happens in there is not going to affect x and y. So at the end of the execution of the function, x and y still remain at the initial values they had, which was 5 and 3. In certain cases, it may be useful to access an external variable from within a function. To do that, arguments can be passed by reference instead of by value. For example, if you look here, instead of sending the value of x, we are passing x itself. Instead of sending the value of y and z, we are passing y and z themselves to the function. This means at the end of the execution of the function, values for x, y, and z may be changed according to whatever happened when they were in the function. Let's use an example to understand this better. But just before we move to the example, notice that when we want to pass anything by reference, we use the AND sign at the end of the data type. So instead of just simply defining it integer a, we define it integer reference of a. Look at this example. So in this case, we have defined a function named duplicate, which is going to accept references. And again, notice that integer with and sign. So it accepts the references to A, B, and C, and then duplicates whatever is inside A, B, and C. So in the main, we define three integers, x equals 1, y equals 3, and z equals 7. And then we pass those values over there to get duplicated. So uh, then we simply print the values to see the result. And in this case, notice that we are printing the value of x, y, and z. And also notice there is no return value in this void function. So because we passed x, y, and z by reference, then they simply become accessible to this function. Remember in the past we said uh, a function has access to the scope of itself and all the variables within that scope because we we're talking about passing by value, not the reference. In case of, a in case of passing uh, by reference, functions gains access to these values and can duplicate and actually just assign them to x, y, and z. Let's see the results. And you can see x equals 2, y equals 6, and z equals 14. Let me just do something here for readability. There you go. And now you can see the result showing up right there. Again, in this example, the function duplicate duplicates the value of its three arguments causing the variable used as arguments to actually be modified by the call. To gain access to its arguments, the function declares its parameters as references. In C++, references are indicated with an ampersand, following the parameter type actually. 
as in the parameters taken by duplicate in the example. When a variable is passed by reference, what is passed is no longer a copy, but the variable itself. Again, it is not the copy of the variable. It is the variable itself. It's like you hand over the variable to the function. The variable identified by the function parameter becomes somehow associated with the argument passed to the function. And any modification under corresponding local variables within the function are reflected in the variables passed as arguments in the call. In fact, A, B, and C become aliases of the arguments passed on the function called X, Y, and Z. And any change on, a with, uh, on or within a uh, function is actually modifying those variables outside the function. Any change in B modifies Y, any change on uh, C modifies Z, and so on and so on. That is why when in this example function duplicate modifies the value of the variables A, B, and C, that actually is the modification of the values X, Y, and Z. So just to see the difference, let's do this. Let's run this program once again. And as you can see now, x2, y6, and z is 14, which are the duplicate of these values. And now I'm going to go ahead and remove the ampersand. Basically, this time, I'm passing them by value instead of a reference. And if I run this, you see the values for x, y, and z remain the same. x is 1, y is 3, z is 7, exactly as here. Because now, I just simply passed it by value. So I'm only going to change a to reference and run it again. And now you see x is duplicated because the alias of x, which is a, is duplicated. But y and z, which are passed by value, not reference, are not duplicated. One thing that you have to consider when using uh, passing by value and passing by reference is the efficiency considerations and constant references. So basically calling a function with uh, parameters taken by value uh, causes copies of the values to be made. This is a relatively inexpensive operation for fundamental types such as integer, but uh, if the parameter is of a uh, large compound type, it may result on certain overhead on your compiler uh, and the runtime uh, resource needs. So let me just clean this up a little bit. So get rid of this guy and clean up the main so uh let's do this i'm gonna define a string uh, concatenate if my spelling is wrong just ignore it so string a so we send string a to this and string b so your first name your last name and basically what it does is it returns a plus b. So pretty simple. Your a plus b is going to be returned. Um, so let's see. Just for the sake of uh, speed, I'm going to pause, write the code, and then return back. Okay, so let's look at it again. So I changed the function, I added the space over here between A and B. And what I do is I'm defining a first name, last name, and a name as a string. And then I'm asking my user to enter their first name, so I enter first name. Then ask them for the last name, so I enter last name. And then finally pass that first name and last name here to the concatenate function to add, add them together and add the space in between. And basically, uh, make it work as your name is this. So the output uh, will be, let me just pretty quick go ahead and enter my first name and my last name. And as you can see, it just print out your name is 
this guy. So that's what this uh, program is doing as of now. So as you can see, the function here takes two strings as parameters by value and returns the result of uh, concatenation of those. Uh, by passing arguments by value in this case, the function forces A and B to be copied of the arguments passed to the function when it is called. Basically, so you're going to have two copies of Ali and Carol Ruby in the memory. And if these are long strings, it may mean copying large quantities of data just for the function call. But uh, let's change it to this guy. So let's add an ampersand here and another ampersand over there. Okay, and let's run it again. So again, I'm going to put my name Ali here and Carol Ruby over there. And you see the result is exactly the same. Correct? So uh, this version of the program now can avoid altogether any type of copy if uh, both of parameters stay being passed by reference, as you can see. So arguments by reference do not require a copy. The function operates directly on the aliases of those strings that are passed as arguments. And at most, it might mean the transfer of certain pointers to the function and nothing more than that. So it's going to save you memory. It's going to save you some processing. And you have to remember, uh, in this regard, the version of concatenate function taking references is more efficient than the other version which is taking values and not references. Since it does not uh, need to copy expensive to copy strings. Remember, when these strings, the names, like it, it, it go longer or you have a string of inputs, then the amount of copy and the resources needed for the copy is going to be much more uh, than what you see over here, especially if you have a larger program or code developed, which is... Um, calling this function in multitude of the times. Uh, so, and also you noticed whether with ampersand or without that, which means uh, by value or reference, the result was the same. So it is good to be careful and uh, define uh, a good and uh, a competent code that actually is efficient too. So on the flip side, functions with reference parameters are generally perceived as uh, functions that modify the argument passed because that is why reference parameters are actually for. The solution is uh, for the function to guarantee that its reference parameters are not going to be modified by this function. So think about it. If you want to have a more efficient code and you use the reference instead of a value, then uh, you are at the jeopardy of those being changed. So if any calculation happens in here, then uh, the original values that you have may be changed. So what you can do is you can go ahead and add a keyword constant to the beginning of every single one of these guys. Now in this case, you're telling them that you have to treat this reference as a constant, which means even if there is a calculation needed to happen on this, at the end of the day, you have to uh, maintain the value of the reference sent to you. So uh, by qualifying these arguments now as a constant, the function is forbidden to modify the values of neither uh, A nor B but uh, can actually access their values as references, aliases of the arguments actually, without having to make actual copies of the string. So basically you told function, hey, look, you can use these as aliases, but you cannot change them anymore. And that's what uh, the constant uh, qualifier is doing over there. Uh, so when you do this, uh, you have an efficient code, and at the same time, you're making sure the original values of your uh, parameters are not being changed. So you have the best of both words. So talking of efficiency, we have to talk about inline functions too. 
Uh, basically, calling a function generally causes a certain overhead like stacking arguments, different jumps, going through different loops, and etc. And uh, thus, for very short function, it may be more efficient to simply insert the code of that function where it is called, instead of performing the process of formally calling a function. So preceding a function declaration with the specifier inline like this basically um, tells the com compiler that the inline expansion is preferred over the uh, usual function call mechanism for a specific function. This does not uh, change at all the behavior of a function. It's going to remain the same, but it's uh, merely used to suggest the compiler that the code generated by the function body shall be inserted at each point the function is called instead of actually being invoked with a regular function call. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. It's just a matter of having a more efficient code. You just add that inline over there. And if, if you run this right now, you're going to see there is no changes. So everything is going to be the same. And let me just answer this guy pretty quick. So everything is the same. The only thing is when compiler compiles this, basically takes this one, return uh, a uh, plus space plus b, and adds it over here. So if I call this function a couple of more times, it is going to take that line and put it over there. So you want to use the end line definition or end line specifier for the functions which are pretty short. Let me just do this so you can see how short it is. It is just one line. So it doesn't really make sense to have it as a function. Uh, some people don't even define it as a function. They just simply put it over here when the calculation is supposed to happen. Because look at this. You have one line of code here that is taking over this line of code. So you might as well just simply put this over here and go from there. However, having it like this function gives you the ability to reuse it somewhere else in the program without even uh, noticing that you're doing it. So compiler is going to turn it for you. So you don't need to be worried about that. Uh, note that most compilers already optimize code to generate inline functions where they see opportunity to improve the efficiency, even if not explicitly marked by you. Therefore, uh, this specifier merely indicates the compiler optimization must happen at this point. And you're saying, hey, look, we know this is supposed to happen. Uh, take care of it. So in, in C++ optimization, uh, this is a task delegated to the compiler, which is uh, free to generate any code for as long as uh, the resulting behavior is the same. And uh, you, you basically have a contract, hey, change my code. As long as you keep the behavior of my program the same, you can change my code to whatever you feel like it is uh, actually efficient. Uh, the other matter to look at uh, is the concept of default values in parameters. So in C++, functions can also have optional parameters for which no arguments are required in the call. In such a way that, for example, a function with uh, three parameters may be called with only two. Let me clean this one up and uh, come up with a different example for this one. So as you can see here, uh, we defined a function called divide, which accepts an integer a and integer b with a default value. So as you can see, there is an initiated value for b to 2, just in case the user forgets to define it. And you can see why that's in a smart move, because in this function, at one point, we're going to divide something, which is that a value by b. And if b is not defined, it's going to be an issue. It's going to be an exception or error for this program. So it's, it's a good move to define um, a default value over there. And in our integer main, basically, we are C outing the division, and we are passing 12. Note that when we pass 12 over there, the default value of B is going to be 2, so it's going to be 12 divided by 2, so the return value of R 
it's going to be equal to 6. Well, when we pass 20 and 4, which basically means we are passing the value for b, then it's going to be 20 divided by 4, and we are expecting, expecting to see uh, 5. Let's run it together. And yes, you see 6 and 5. I can even have a default value for a or anything. So the only thing that default value does is make sure that your function will work even if the parameter is not passed to it. You, you, you may have different type of uh, passings, uh, but at the same time, if you have a default value, it's going to substitute when there is no passing at all. So in C++, identifiers can only be used in expressions once they have been declared. For example, some uh, variable x cannot be used before being declared with a statement such as integer x, or the value r cannot be used here unless you have it as integer r and defined from the beginning, or before you use it. Uh, the same applies to the functions. So functions cannot be called before they are declared. That is why, if you noticed, in all the examples that are used, the functions were always defined before the main. So I always kept main at the bottom and first defined the function. Because in the same way that you cannot have r here, let me get rid of this definition for now. And uh, you see R cannot be used over there anymore. So it's going to be a problem. The same way, and since I hate to see those red things, so I'm just get rid of it. So the same uh, principle applies to the function. So this function must be defined somewhere before this point. That is the first time we're calling the function. So again, functions cannot be called before they're declared. And uh, the prototype of a function can be declared without actually defining the function completely as a part of your uh, development process. Let's say if I want to do something and I know that I'm going to have a function that is called integer or remember the one that we did like float tax, I can simply do this. Sorry, I just added extra parentheses. I can simply do this and move on. So now I have a prototype of float here and I can use tax somewhere down the road. So um, I can call it here or do whatever I want with it. Uh, and it is important that uh, sometimes like this guy, you have to put uh, a return value just for the compiler to leave you alone. Um, no matter what you do, make sure the function is defined before you use it. Uh, that's the key. And uh, this type of prototyping is very uh, common in development. You have a complicated uh, calculation to deal with a couple of times down your program. Don't wait for that. Simply come down. Um, just put this as a placeholder, the prototype as a placeholder, and then move down, use the tag somewhere down the road in your main and then you can always come back and uh, define uh, the tags up there. Uh, the last part of this video, um, I would like to mention uh, recursive functions. We will have more examples and more practices on uh, other videos about the same matter, but since we want to finish everything about functions in just one place, let's talk about recursivity too. And before that, let me clean up my screen so I can have a better space over here. So recursivity basically uh, is the property of a function that the function uh, can be called by itself. So yes, it is a little bit confusing at the beginning, but that actually is a very useful feature for some tasks such as uh, uh, sorting elements or calculating the factorial of a number. Uh, for example, in order to obtain the factorial of a number or uh, n factorial as you had it in the math, you basically um, have a uh, mathematical formula as so you have uh, n times, then uh, that's going to be n minus 1, 
and then again it's going to be times n minus 2 and you continue uh, the same pattern and multiply uh, by 1 minus 1 minus 1 till you get to multiplication by uh, 1 actually. So that's the mathematical formula. Uh, for example, if you have 5 factorial, it's going to be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And uh, you can have a code for this in uh, C++ using the recursivity of a function that uh, makes life very easy. So to develop this code, I will consider uh, a long factorial function. So basically this is my function basic and I'm gonna pass a long integer a into it. And within the function, uh, what I will do is basically I'm gonna check if uh, a is greater than 1, so basically I know that my factorial process is over or not, this is what this if does to me. And then if it is not the case, then I'm going to return a times the factorial of the a. If you look at the formula up there, you can see it's basically the same thing happening, but with the argument of a minus 1 every time. So uh, that, that simply is calling the function within a function. So else, if that is not the case, I'm going to return 1 because there is no reason to... Oh, sorry about that. So else, I will return 1 because that's for any other situation. And this guy should be a minus 1. So pretty simple. As you can see, it's going to count and it's going to call itself again. So it's going to deduct one by one by one and move on as long as a is greater than one. You can implement this uh, function with uh, if then else's and loops, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be much larger than this. It actually is a nice practice if you try to develop this without using of recursivity and see what happens to what you do. Remember one thing that uh, every time that you get to this place, uh, a is going to be deducted by 1 no matter what, and then you're going to run this again and again and again. So, let's go to integer main, and then uh, I'm going to define a number, whatever. Let's say we want to calculate 10 factorial. That's, uh, that's uh, you can also get this from the input. You can do a C out, C in, and ask the user to provide it, but for the sake of this, example I'll just go and put number out and uh, then I'm gonna add a factorial sign to make it look nice this is just output formatting remember nothing else and then I'm gonna return factorial and look at this then I'm gonna call the factorial right here so I'm not going to go and assign another parameter, call it like long output, uh, and output and then assign number of 10 to that long output. I basically am calling right here in the output formatting as we discussed before. Uh, that's another way to optimize your code to be as uh, concise as possible. So this, this kit is going to run and is going to give us the 10 factorial. Okay, and uh, let us make it look a little bit nicer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go with like 5 factorial that we already know should be equal to 120. And there we go, 5 factorial equals 120. Notice how in, uh, in this function, the factorial function, we included a call to itself again. But that call only happens if the argument passed was greater than 1 since otherwise uh, the function f would perform an infinite uh, recursive loop uh, in which once it arrived to 0 it would continue multiplying with all the negative numbers in the word probably provoking a stack overflow at some point uh, during the runtime. Uh, so I want you to always think when you want to use the recursive functions 
make sure you have a break out of the loop process over there some condition that you set in order for the recursive function to be able to break out and uh, that's uh, pretty much it for this video